Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from today. Uh, we are, would well, like to thank you for joining us for our Well-Built Canada live streaming training. Today, we're going to be reviewing STEAM 101, the science of STEAM, with our product sales manager, the Sultan of STEAM, Ron Sterning. Session will be about a half hour long to about 45 minutes, followed by a Q&A segment. Jeff Scott, Doug Howard, Mary Ann, and Kyle are here on board helping us support today. And myself, Sanjeev Bello, will be moderating the webinar today. Let's go over some housekeeping notes. You should have received an attendee setup doc uh, with your invite and registration. And all participants have been muted and your cameras have been turned off. Let's review how to use the toolbar. And on the top right hand corner, you'll see an orange arrow. If you click on that, it'll expand your toolbar, giving you access to the materials tab, um, questions and polls and chat function. So if you click on that, it'll expand and open up. Once you've clicked on that, uh, you can ask questions by clicking on the question tab. You can type in your questions and we'll either save those for the Q&A segment at the end of the webinar, or if there are quick responses that you require, then we'll respond to them during the webinar as well. In addition to that, there's a chat function at the bottom. You can also click on that. You can chat with us throughout the poll. Uh, live questions will be asked, so you can answer your live questions through the chat function. In addition, we have a handouts tab that has a variety of handouts that are going to be able that are available to support the webinar. You can download them during the webinar or they will be emailed to you one hour after the end of the webinar concludes. Uh, for our French speaking sales reps, Tom Carmen unfortunately is not joining us today, but you can email him at tom.carmen at wellbolt.com if you do have any questions in regards to what we're covering off today. I'm going to pass it over to the Sultan of Steam. Ron, it's off to you. Good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us. Today, we're going to be talking about STEAM, <clears throat> the basics of STEAM, how STEAM cooks. I'm really not going to focus in on, on Cleveland product. We all know that Cleveland is number one in the North America, number one in the industry. So I'm not going to go through all the great reasons why to buy Cleveland, but I'm going to talk about STEAM, how it cooks, why it cooks, why do you use STEAM. I'm going to show uh, various ways of cooking with steam. I'm gonna talk about the principles of steam uh, with steamers, with kettles and, and so forth, how it transfers its heat energy and all that. So first of all, I wanna show you a couple items that I've brought here. Um, I'm gonna do some broccoli. Basically, I'm gonna show you how well broccoli comes out of a steamer and why uh, it's basically gonna come out sexy. Sexy broccoli is what you're gonna end up seeing. Next. I'm gonna show you rice. Why would you do rice in a steamer and why it turns out so well? Um, I'm gonna add some water to this rice right now. And in this rice, when you normally cook rice on a stove top, what you do is you add one part rice and two parts water. I'm gonna be, I've added uh, one part rice and one and a half parts water. So not as much water as you typically do when you do stovetop. I'll explain why I've done it that way. And lastly, I'm gonna do a, a cake. I'm gonna steam a cake, bake a cake, steam a cake in our steamer. So first of all, I'm gonna put all this food into the steamer. We've got, uh, I'm going to be using our 22 CET 3.1 boilerless steamer. I'll put that all in here. One. <clears throat> two and three close that up and put the timer on for five minutes five minutes because i'm going to be taking the broccoli out after five minutes so it's um a full cook of about 20 25 minutes but broccoli is very short and i can cook multiple products at the same time in my steamer. I'll explain to you why I can do that and why I don't get flavor transfer. Why my cake isn't gonna taste like broccoli and so forth. So in saying all that, I have to do a few PowerPoint presentations and then we're gonna get back to real life. And these PowerPoint presentations show us 
how steam cooks, why it cooks fast, and so forth. So let's start off with these PowerPoint presentations. Okay. <clears throat> In this presentation, we are going to be talking about a lot of different steamers, uh, countertop, floor model, boiler, boilerless, pressure boiler, pressureless boiler, all those models are all covered in this presentation and um, we're going to talk about when you should uh, recommend one over the other at a later point in time. But first let's talk about steam, how it transfers heat energy and how it cooks. Next slide please. Okay, so first of all it takes one BTU of steam energy to raise one pound of water, one degree Fahrenheit at sea level. So that's what a BTU is. Next, next slide, please. It takes to bring water from uh, a freezing point, 32 degrees Fahrenheit, or zero degrees Celsius for you younger kids. Um, it takes 180 BTUs of energy to bring that water up to a boil, or 212 degrees Fahrenheit, or for the younger guys, 100 degrees Celsius. Okay, it takes that much energy, 180 BTUs of energy to bring it to a boil. Next slide, please. Next, you'll see that in this case, it's room temperature, 72 degrees, from 72 degrees water to a boil, it took 140 BTUs of energy. However, to change state from water into steam, it takes another 970,000 BTUs, um, uh, 970 uh, BTUs, uh, more energy to bring it to change state from water into steam. So this steam now has over a thousand BTUs of energy in it. So let's, let's uh, quit with the slides. I've basically given you an idea of how much energy that steam has. And I'm going to go over here to a steam kettle that I've put on the stovetop. And I'm going to show you something. As soon as I light up. <clears throat> okay. This steam kettle is almost to a boil. I've had it kind of ready, ready standby. And I want to explain what steam really is. Steam is a dry, invisible gas. You cannot see steam. When you see steam, we'll call it, it's not steam any longer, it's condensation. And steam, keep in mind, is only 212 degrees Fahrenheit or 100 degrees Celsius. The temperature of a flame underneath here might be 450, 500 degrees. I can put my hand over that flame all day long, just as long as I'll hold it there. But with this steam kettle, if I could take a look over here, Kyle, you can see at the, at the spout there, you can't see any steam because that is steam. It's a dry, invisible gas. Over here, this you can, we'll call it sea steam, but that's no longer steam, that's condensation. And I'm holding my hand there and I'm not burning myself. If I would put my hand right there at the tip of that uh, kettle, I would burn myself instantly. And the reason I'd burn myself instantly is that that steam has 970 uh, BTUs of energy in it. As soon as I touch my hand, to that spout, to that hot steam, that's hot, 212 degrees, as soon as I touch it, it will condense onto my hand, my cold hand. And as soon as it condenses, it gives up 970 BTUs of energy to my hand instantly. So that's why a steam burn is so bad as compared to a, a, a flame here where I could hold my hand over all day long, but I could never touch steam, actual steam, that dry invisible gas, and not burn myself instantly. It gives up its heat energy, 970 BTUs of energy instantly to my hand. Or to food, any food that might be in the, in the steamer or so forth. 
Steam has six times more energy than boiling water. So that's again, I can put it in boiling water or I can put it in a steamer and it will cook faster in a steamer than it will in boiling water. This sexy broccoli should be done very shortly. And yeah, another minute maybe, and then we're gonna take that out. And then I'm going to do a quick poll question. And after that, we're gonna talk a little bit more about how steam is made in various steamers, boiler, boilerless, steam generators, pressure boilers, and so forth. So now we've got the uh, uh, basics of steam. Temperature of steam is 212, uh, 100 degrees Celsius. It's a dry, invisible gas. Because it's a dry, invisible gas, that's how come I can steam my cake. It has six times more energy than boiling water. And, it, and the other thing is that it expands 1,600 times in size when I bring water to a boil. So a drop of water will expand 1,600 times in size um, once I turn it to steam. Now, the reason that's important is that that's why I don't get any flavor transfer. As water boils, it expands 1,500, 1,600 times in size, and it will push any air down the drain. It creates a bit of a pressure and it pushes that air down the drain. And now, because I've removed all oxygen or air out of the compartment, I don't get a flavor transfer. Oh, this should be buzzing any second. There we go. Buzzing, actually, I need a cloth. I'm sorry, I should have had a cloth, Andy. All right, it throws me a paper towel. You know I'm a big chicken when it comes to burning myself with steam, but that's okay. Don't, don't worry about it, buddy. So we're going to take out the broccoli and I'm going to continue cooking the rice. Well, look at that. Sexy broccoli. Have you ever seen sexy broccoli before? Well, now you have. Look at how bright and colorful and vibrant that is. Now. One of the good things about cooking with steam is that you get a lot of color. It doesn't wash the color out as if I would be boiling this in water. You keep all the nutrients behind, so it's actually more nutritious. I don't, I don't leach out the minerals and the uh, vitamins and so forth. So steaming vegetables obviously is a fantastic way. It's also very, very forgiving. When we take out the rice, we take out the, the cake, you'll see that it's a very forgiving way of cooking. It won't stick, scorch, burn. Why? It's only 212 or 100 degrees Celsius. So it's not very hot, but it has a lot of energy in it. Now, also what happens is when the product is brought up to a, uh, a higher temperature, the temperature of steam, 212, 100 degrees, and comes close to cold food, it will condense slightly, adding a little bit of moisture to the product, but will condense ever so slightly and will transfer its heat energy. As the product gets hotter and hotter and hotter, it's not cold any longer, and so therefore less steam or less energy will transfer onto the product. So it's a very forgiving way of cooking. So I could leave that cake in there much longer than I need to, and maybe forget about it and come back and it still will be a nice cake or a nice rice and it won't be overcooked. So it's a very forgiving way of, of, of transferring uh, or, or cooking. So right now, I'm gonna do a couple poll questions just to keep things interesting and uh, keep you guys on your toes. A couple poll questions and then I'm gonna get back into boiler, boilerless and so forth. Perfect. Thanks, Ron. Thanks for all the details on STEAM. Uh, we're going to launch the poll questions. You can answer the questions directly on your screen. You don't need to go anywhere. Just answer the questions directly on there. We'll give you updates and the correct answers and how the poll is, is running. Let's launch that first question. STEAM has three times the heat energy of boiling water. True or false? We have 2% voted 4%. 6, 17, 21. 32, 
34, 40, 42, 43%. All right, we're gonna close the poll in three, two, and one. The correct answer is false. It's actually six times the energy of boiling water as per Ron's explanation of steam. Let's launch question number two. The temperature of steam is 100 degrees Fahrenheit, 100 degrees Celsius, 212 degrees Fahrenheit, or both B and C. And the Fahrenheit is, or Celsius is for you young guys as Ron referred it to us. All right, so we've got 5%, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50, 55% have voted. We're going to close the poll off in three, two, and one. And the correct answer is B and C. 64% of you have selected the correct answer. All right, I'm going to pass it back to Ron to continue with the science of steam. Ron? Okay, guys, well, I threw in a curveball there, a little trick question uh, with how much, how, uh, how much more energy does steam have over boiling water? I threw it in at a three, three times, but as you know, it now has six times the amount of energy. Next, what we're gonna talk about is how we make steam. How we make steam with boilerless steamers, how we make steam with boiler steamers, how we make steam with pressure boilers, and so forth. So first of all, this steamer here is a, our model is a 21 CT8, and it is, it has a generator, a steam generator. This one here where I'm cooking in right now, it's a 22 CT 3.1 uh, steam chef. It has no steam generator, or it's considered boilerless. So if I take a look at this, this unit here, you'll see a descaling port on top. And the reason is that I have a steam generator in here and I cannot see the inside of that steam generator it's right here so this sometimes is called a boiler and in truth it's not a boiler it's a steam generator boilers are pressure vessels that means that on our larger steamers we have uh, steam generators but they're pressure vessels, so they're considered a boiler. This is considered a steam generator. So what happens here is I fill the boiler, we'll call it, three quarters of the way up with water, and that water uh, is heated with this element at the bottom. We actually have something very unique in our steamer, and that's an element above the water line, and that's called a drier element. Remember, steam is a dry, invisible gas. We don't want moisture. Moisture is lost energy. So what happens is as this water starts to boil, it will pass by the drier element and then go into the compartment via these steam tubes. Sorry, you can't see these steam tubes, but I'll show you inside here. Inside here, we have two nozzles or two steam jets. Basically, what happens is all the steam that the generator can produce will be forced out through these two nozzles. And just like a garden hose where you force all the water out of a small little nozzle, it shoots out very far. So by forcing all the steam that I can manufacture out of that steam generator through these two nozzles, the steam comes whistling out of there very, very quickly, and it creates a convection action. So the steam swirling around inside here, convection simply means movement of gases. So in a convection oven, I'm moving air. In a convection steamer, I'm moving steam. With the boilerless steamer, and I'm going to show you that after our uh, after our rice and our cake is done. With a boilerless steamer, the steam comes from the bottom and wafts into the compartment. If I didn't have something moving that steam, and we have a fan at the back, this would be just a steamer. It wouldn't be a convection steamer. When I go 
with the with the with these steamers, these convection steamers, the pressure in that boiler is zero psi, or in other words, atmospheric. There's no pressure building up inside the boiler or steam generator, and there's no pressure building up inside the cavity as well. So convection steamers operate on zero psi. I can open and close the steamer as much as I want, and I'll even do this. I'll show you. I can open and close that steamer and don't have to worry about going in there. I can go in there and add product or whatever. Very friendly way to use uh, a steamer. Now we're gonna have to go back to the slides. I only have so many pieces of equipment here, so we're gonna go back to the slides. I'm gonna show you a few things. So first of all, with this slide here, it's how do we make steam? Well, we make steam in these three models. Um, we make them with atmospheric steam generators. So manufactured of stainless steel, and uh, as you saw, how they produce steam, all three of these models, the, the ones on the right would be just bigger stainless steel steam generators than the one on the left. Next picture, please. Next slide. Okay, this is the next way that we manufacture steam, and that is a pressure boiler. So a larger cavity or larger steamer, and we manufacture the steam with a boiler that's manufactured out of, out of mild steel. It's the law that you must manufacture a pressure boiler out of mild steel. Now, what's unique about us is that we actually dip that boiler into a bath of nickel. And the reason is that mild steel will rust. And if we didn't do that, it will eventually rust its way through and you'll have a hole in the boiler by dipping it into a bath of nickel, which we are the only ones that do that as far as I know, by dipping it in a, back of, a bath of nickel, we now have the entire inside and outside nickel plated and nickel won't rust. So now we extend the life of the boiler considerably. Next, ne oh, by the way, sorry, I forgot to tell you that our pressure boilers have a maximum PSI of 15 psi so um, these are considered low pressure boilers they're the reason we even use these boilers is that they have the ability to feed steam jacketed kettles or direct steam jacketed kettles so i can take that low pressure steam and feed it to a kettle if we continue on These, this picture here shows us of various models where we have a pressure boiler. The two on the left are convection steamers. In other words, the boiler down below is pressure. It, it's a low pressure boiler up to 15 PSI. It operates about 10 or 12. And it will feed steam directly into the cavities. But the cavity is open, has an open drain. And so now, it does not build up any pressure inside the cavity. The convection steamer, they are convection steamers and they are zero PSI. Now the good thing is I can take that boiler, steam pressure and feed a kettle if I wanted to. I cannot feed a kettle with an atmospheric steam uh, generator. I need a differential between the temperature of the steam and the temperature of the boiling water or soup that I wanna make. It's, I will get, I'll show you later that when I pressurize steam, only then does it go up in temperature. Atmospherically, it's 212 or 100 degrees Celsius. The steamer on the right, that's called the pressure steamer. We operate the boiler at about five PSI and we make, we make that steam come into the compartment and the drain of that compartment is closed. So the pressure in the compartment will equalize to five PSI. The downside about that is those big submarine doors, you know, I lock them in and then that's it. I can't go in and out like I did with this little steamer here, go in and out, check on food, add some product, whatever. So it's good for bulk cooking, 
large volumes, like let's say uh, an army base where I'm doing hundreds of pounds of potatoes or something like that, I'm doing large volume in that regard. And because it's under pressure, the temperature of the steam is hotter. And because the temperature of steam is above 212, hotter, it will cook a little bit faster than a convection steamer. Next slide, please. That <clears throat> slide is about boilerless uh, steamers. And we're gonna show you that in just a couple minutes when this times out, how we manufacture steam in a boilerless steamer. One of the big advantages to a boilerless steamer is scale buildup. With the steamer here, we can, we can quit with the slides now and I'll just show my pretty face. There we go. So with this steamer here, basically what happens is all the steam that's produced is pure distilled water that comes into the cavity, pure distilled water. It leaves all the minerals behind. So eventually that boiler at the back there will get coated with minerals and calcium and scale. So we have to clean that out. The downside about this unit is I can't see inside that boiler. I can add my descaling solution in here, but it's difficult to know exactly how much to add and so forth. Realistically, I should open up the boiler uh, there's a access port here, open up the boiler and shine a flashlight inside and, and actually see how bad the scale is and so forth. And then add the descaling solution, seeing how, if it does a good job or not. With the boilerless steamer, I'll show you in a minute, we can see where the steam is being produced and I can see how much scale is being produced at any point in time. Much friendlier maintenance wise. There's one other way of manufacturing steam. So this is called a boilerless steamer. And I'm gonna talk about this animal right here. This, although this unit has a boiler in it or steam generator, really, it does not pressurized. We also manufacture the same ovens with boilerless. And the way manu we boilerless steam works is that uh, boilerless combi oven, sorry, boilerless combi ovens, a dribble water onto the fan. The fan throws that water onto the hot elements that are inside the cavity and vaporizes that steam. If it's a gas unit, it's got heat exchangers back there. Again, hot heat exchangers vaporizing the steam, and that's how it turns that steam into a gas, that dry, invisible gas that I was talking about. Now, I'm going to give up on this unit here. I'm actually going to pull this out already. I'm going to, it's only another two minutes. I'm going to turn that off. <clears throat> and I'm going to pull out the rice. And I'm going to show you how nice that rice is. Now, on a stovetop, if you're not careful and you don't watch it, you're gonna end up burning your rice if it, uh, all that water evaporates. Remember I told you I use one and a half parts water instead of two parts water? That's because on the stovetop, some of that water evaporates. Here, none of the water evaporates, it stays inside the pan. As a matter of fact, I actually add the minuscule, a little bit of water to the product as the steam condenses, touches the, touches the rice and gives up its energy. So if I take a look here, perfectly done rice. I don't have to worry about sticking, scorching, burning, absolutely nothing stick, sticks to the bottom. There's nothing, it's perfectly done rice. I didn't have to watch it at all. I just steamed away. Now, the, the cake here, if I pull out the cake, there's my cake, perfectly done cake. I'm going to take a little bit of it one second. I'm going to go to a knife over here, if I have a knife. And if I don't have a knife, all right, buddy, thank you. My assistant there, I can cut through this cake. I can lift it up and I can show you how moist it is, how nice that cake turns out. So 
this is showing you that steam is a dry, invisible gas. This is showing you that steam is a very uh, forgiving way of cooking because it's not hot. It's only 212 degrees or 100 degrees Celsius. So that's some of the reasons why I would steam a product, the broccoli, the sexy broccoli, because it turns out sexy, the cake, because uh, once I put some, some icing on top, very nice and moist and plump, it's the rice, obviously, I don't have to watch it. I don't have to do anything like that. Now I'm going to come back over here, and I'm going to show you the boilerless steamer. This, by the way, has become our most popular steamer. It's a little hot. Normally, you wouldn't be doing this while it's hot, but one second. There we go, just that it's hot. I don't want to burn myself. Now, if I look inside there, there's the boiler, but there isn't a boiler. It's, it's boiler-less. So as compared to combi ovens, the way they manufacture steam and this manufactures steam, simply by filling up about an inch worth of water, the elements are clamped to the underside of this, of this compartment. They bring the water to a boil. The water waft, uh, steam wafts up into the compartment, and at the back, I got a little fan that aids in the uh, convection process. By using it as a convection steamer, it speeds up the cooking process. Now, let's talk about this as far as why wouldn't I always recommend the boilerless? Because you can see, I can see how much scales built up there. It's a little bit there, easy for me to clean out wipe out, add a little vinegar, add a little descaling solution, whatever. Why wouldn't I recommend this all the time? And the reason is that this isn't as good an a la carte steamer. In other words, opening and closing, opening and closing the door, if I was a red lobster or something like that, it wouldn't keep up as well as this unit here. This unit here recovers quickly when I'm opening and closing the door. So this would be good for a la carte. This would be good for bulk cooking. As far as bulk cooking goes, they're pretty well equal. So if I put rice in here, it's 20 minutes. Rice in here, it's 20 minutes. However, if I'm opening, closing, open, closing the door, this 21 CT8 will outperform this one. So restaurants probably would be better off with this. Long-term care, where they have all the time in the world to cook their lunch or their dinner, would be better off with this. Okay, now uh, we're going to do a live question. And that live question is, I talked about pressure boilers. And the, uh, this pressure boiler, we manufacture low-pressure boilers. What is the maximum steam pressure of a low pressure boiler. The first person to answer that question through the chat is gonna get some great prizes. I got a couple prizes up here. So if you can answer that question, after that, we'll go back to some of this seminar that we're doing. Sanjeev. We're good? So somebody wanted some great prizes. So now we're gonna talk about steam when it comes to steam jacketed kettles, how they work. And so I have to unfortunately go back to the PowerPoint presentation. And then from there, we're gonna go back and look at this little kettle that I have sitting over here on my left. One more slide, please. <clears throat> one more slide. One more slide. Oh, oh, okay. We've already talked about uh, uh, steamers, where to where to uh, to locate them. We talked about pressureless, uh, boilerless steamers, long-term care, so forth. Restaurants and larger steamers would be 
more for larger institutions or the pressure pressure steamer, something like an army base. Let's jump over and talk about kettles. Okay, how do we make steam in a steam jacket kettles? This is a picture of an electric kettle and our gas kettle. Um, the way an electric kettle works is you fill a little bit of water up at the bottom of the, of the kettle. Then from there, the elements are submerged in that water. The elements heat up that water, turns the water into steam, and the steam surrounds the jacket of the kettle. The steam energy is used up with transferring it to the bowl. And as soon as that steam energy, that 970 BTUs is transferred to the bowl, it condenses back into water and drips back down to the bottom of the bowl where the, um, where the elements heat up that water again and it surrounds the jacketed kettle. These are called self-contained steam jacketed kettles. So the water stays in there for the life of the kettle. On the right, we've got our patented gas kettles and they use a heat exchanger. So the water you can see is around the tube on the heat exchanger and we've got a burner that sits inside that tube. It heats up that entire tube and when it heats up the water in that tube, the water turns into a steam, into gas, it goes up into the bowl and that gas, that steam energy transfers its heat and then condenses, falls back down into the heat exchanger and the whole process goes over again. So on the next slide, I wanna show you something. And that is pressure versus steam temperature. So at zero PSI, the temperature of steam is 212 degrees or 100 degrees Celsius. However, we operate our kettles at a maximum of about 25 PSI. So about 266 degrees Fahrenheit, 130 degrees Celsius. That's what temperature the inside of that bowl is. So we're gonna go over here, I'm gonna show you. So <clears throat> right now, this kettle is stone cold. And I'm going to, just give me a second. I'm gonna show you right here. If you take a look at this, you'll see a pressure gauge right here. The pressure gauge is actually in a vacuum state. So zero PSI is here, and this kettle is in a vacuum state. All steam jacketed kettles, self-contained, are put into a vacuum. And the way they do that, remember I told you, steam expands 1,600 times in size. So what they do is they bring the water to a boil, it creates a pressure, and then they release that pressure out of the kettle, which releases any air that might be in the jacket. They close that, that vent up, and now when the kettle cools, it goes into a vacuum state. So as steam condenses and goes back from this big down to this big, it will create a vacuum. So you want to be in a vacuum in a kettle because I, uh, air acts as an insulator. So now, as the kettle heats up, the pressure will build up and will build up to a maximum of 25 PSI, which is a 266 degrees Fahrenheit or 130 Celsius. Now, the reason is I need hotter steam temperatures if I want to bring two, this soup, 212 degree soup, or bring it to a boil, I need hotter steam temperatures than 212. I can't have zero PSI in here which is 212 to try to get this up to 212. I need a differential. I wanna show you something that's kind of interesting. I'm gonna turn this kettle on. And right now, the temperature is set for 266 degrees Fahrenheit. I can change that to whatever I want, but you can see the maximum that I can get is 266. Okay, the elements have just clicked on. You can see this is heating up. And what's interesting is, hear that sound? A lot of customers think there's something wrong with the kettle when they hear that banging and rattling and so forth. What's happening now 
This is just an interesting kind of facts. What's happening right now is that the elements are getting hot. Around the elements, the water is turning into a boil. It's turning that water into steam. And that bubble of steam, because it expands, that bubble of steam is rising up through the jacket. And as that bubble of steam comes higher up in the jacket, it's coming in contact with the cold water. And I'm going to turn this off. Coming into contact with the cold water. And as it comes into contact, it will condense from steam back into water. And so now that collapsing of steam is the sound that you hear. It's just like I explain it, lightning and thunder. When lightning comes down from the sky, it, it displaces the air by about a foot. As the lightning dissipates, that air comes back together and claps, which is the sound of thunder. So the same thing is happening here. The little bubbles collapsing are making that sound because it's in a vacuum state, so that, that sound travels very, very well. So that's kind of interesting on how a steam jack kettle works. Again, it's important to know that we must operate on a pressure to get higher steam temperatures. I think we're right now ready for a poll question or a couple poll questions just to keep things interesting. All right, we're gonna launch our second set of poll questions. You're gonna get two questions. Uh, that are going to come up. Please note you can just answer the question directly on your screen. You don't have to transfer or change any of your settings. That's launch question number three. Cleveland kettles operate at 25 PSI max. That translates to 212 degrees Fahrenheit, 100 degrees Celsius, 266 degrees Fahrenheit, or 130 degrees Celsius, or 350 degrees Fahrenheit, or 177 degrees Celsius, or none of the above. All right, we've got a ton of people that have already voted. As I was going through all of that, we've got 52, 58% already voted, and it closed a poll off in three, two, and one. The correct answer that we are looking for was 260 degrees Fahrenheit or 130 degrees Celsius. 94% of you got the correct answer. Great job, great job listening. So let's launch question number four. Cleveland convection steamers operate at 5 PSI, 0 PSI, or 212 degrees Fahrenheit and 100 degrees Celsius, or B and C. Got 4% voted 6, 10, 15, 23%, 29%, 33%, 37, 42%, 48%, 50%, 52%. Want to close the poll off in 3, 2, and 1. All right, the correct answer that we are looking for was. B and C, that it is both zero PSI or 212 degrees Fahrenheit and 100 degrees Celsius for the convection steamers. All right, thanks for participating in the polls. I'm going to pass it back to Ron. All righty. So we've gone through the basics of steam. Uh, you know what, forgiving because it's only 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Actually, when the kettle uh, one of the things that's so great about a kettle, I should have really have mentioned that, is that it's only 266 degrees Fahrenheit, 130 degrees Celsius. So that's not very hot, but lots of energy, lots of energy. So it cooks fast, brings that product up to a boil fast, but it won't stick, scorch, burn because it's not very hot. Unlike a pot on a stove where you got 450 degree flame underneath, if you don't stir your spaghetti sauce, you're in danger of burning it. Here, the spaghetti sauce will never burn because it's not very hot, only 266 degrees Fahrenheit, 130 degrees Celsius. So that's the advantage of cooking with steam in a steam jacketed kettle. Basically, we're done. We've talked about all the pros and cons or the advantages of, of uh, cooking with steam, uh, boiler, boilerless. Um, we've talked about steam jacket kettles, why they're so good to, to cook with. And so we're pretty much done now. I think what we're going to do is take some questions, if there are any questions, and then we're going to call it a wrap. All right, perfect, Ron. We do have a couple of quick questions. Uh, when you were cooking the broccoli, the rice, and the steam, one of the questions that came in, is there any specific reason or ideology in terms of where you place 
each product so that way there's no product transfer or flavor print transfer? Yeah, <clears throat> there was. You'll notice that I put the broccoli on the bottom. And the reason is that it had a perforated pan. Um, I don't want the broccoli drippings, there will be a little bit of drippings, dripping into the rice or into the, well, that doesn't really matter so much into the rice, so minuscule amount, but I didn't want it dripping into the cake. But yes, you would put things that might drip, you'd put them on the bottom. By the way, you notice I used two and a half inch deep pans. The way steam transfers its energy is by touching the food. If you put it in a six inch deep pan, the steam can't touch the food at the very bottom of that pan. You need a shallower pan so it can transfer its heat energy. Perfect. One of the other questions that came in is you mentioned descaling on the steamers. How frequently do you recommend doing this? And can do you need to use a descaler, but or can you use vinegar as you mentioned earlier? Well, when it comes to something like the boilerless, you can use vinegar once a week or something like that. <clears throat> You could use vinegar once a week on the boiler style or generator style. However, it's difficult to see, you know, how good the job is doing and so forth. There's a little bit, uh, a bit of a pain in the butt kind of idea on the boiler or generator style. So the right way to do the generator is it's, it's, it's almost impossible for me to tell you how often because how bad is the water? How often are you steaming? How often do you turn the unit off? and so forth and so on. So the right way to do it is opening up the boiler uh, handhold access plate, <clears throat> shining a flash on in there, seeing how bad the scale is, and then base your decision on that. If you look inside there after three months, and I would say after three or four months of use, that's when you should look at the first time. Take a look, see how bad the scale is. If it's really bad, okay, I gotta do it a little more often. If it's not so bad, maybe a little bit less. And from there, do a descaling, probably not with vinegar, wouldn't be a strong enough acid, probably something like lime away. And then from there, do the descaling, open up the generator again, see if you've done a good job or not, and that tells you how much acid that you have to add. And then once you nail that down every four months, we'll say, with a, a cup of lime away, then you know that you can do it that way Every four months, you don't have to open up the generator every time. Perfect. Thanks, Ron, for all the great details on when to descale. Next question is, which is more efficient, gas or electric for a convection steamer and a steam kettle? Um, efficiency is a, is a funny, funny word because uh, an electric kettle, almost 100% of the energy goes into the boiling of the water. For a gas kettle, our, our gas kettles are very, very efficient at about 65% efficiency. However, I think the question is not so much efficiency as speed. Our gas kettles are about twice as fast as our standard electric kettles, meaning with standard wattage. If I want to compare the speed of gas and electric and I want to be equal, I would have to go to high wattage kettles, which have double the amount of elements, but will now rival the gas kettle or our gas kettle in speed and performance. When it comes to, uh, when it comes to steamers, the electric countertop steamer is about twice as fast as our gas countertop steamer. So I would always recommend the boilerless, uh, boilerless, sorry, boilerless. I'd always recommend electric if you can, because it's much faster than the gas boilerless. All right, perfect. Thanks, Ron. In terms of Cleveland and the steamers, where are they manufactured? All of our steamers are manufactured in Toronto at Highway 7 and Keel. So all of the kettles, steamers, skillets, everything Cleveland is built in Canada, which is a nice thing for Canadian manufacturing. Uh, it's always great to have something in your own backyard and say it proudly that it's made in Canada. Uh, next question is, how are we on lead times and inventory as it relates to steamers? I have them in stock, guys. Give me a PO. Have them in stock. I have. I actually stock all of our countertop models. I stock uh, our smaller gas, ke gas kettles, electric kettles, our skillets. I stock almost 
almost a broad broad line worth of uh, worth of equipment. Only once it gets into really large steamers do I not stock them or large kettles. All right, that's great, Ron. Uh, I believe that answers all of our questions as it relates to anything that's been posted in the chat. So, uh, Ron, do you want to just do a quick recap and then we'll close up the webinar? Okay, well, I think we've kind of covered it, but, uh, you know, steam 212, a dry invisible gas, six times more energy than boiling water, expands 1,600 times in size as it expands into the compartment. It pushes any air down the compartment. That's why I don't get any flavor transfer. It's a very fast, forgiving way of cooking um, when it comes to steam jacket kettles. It's forgiving because it's not very hot, but has tons of energy, 970 BTUs of energy in it. As soon as it touches cold, it will condense and give up all that energy. And that's why cooking with steam is so uh, forgiving and so fast. I thank you all for joining. It took me a little longer than I expected, but I hope you enjoyed the, uh, the session. Back to you, all, right. all right, perfect. Thanks, Ron. Uh, in terms of some housekeeping notes, live question winner. The question was, what is the maximum steam pressure of a low pressure boiler? We're looking for the correct answer, which was 15 PSI. Uh, Mike Jackson out paced everyone else in terms of answering the question. We had about 15 or 20 people that actually answered the question correctly. So Mike Jackson, thank you for the quick response. We will send you out some great garland swag. Um, so we appreciate you guys uh, participating and in, in being a part of that live question piece. Please ensure you follow us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. We are constantly putting a variety of data onto, onto these social media feeds and you can earn and, and learn about some great products and some and new things that are happening with Wellbuilt Canada. All right, our next webinar will be taking place on November 15th. We're gonna have Greg Hodder coming in to talk about Mary Chef Connect. So please mark your calendars down for that particular date as we're gonna be re reviewing our new product launch on the Connex 12 and Connex 16. Um, please note that all the materials for today's webinar will be emailed to you an hour after our, our webinar. You'll be able to access the handouts. As well, all of our all of our recordings for our webinars are now located on our well-built portal asset guide, which is Binder. You can access any of, your, of our training videos there. So if someone unfortunately wasn't able to join us today, you can actually watch us live there. Um, in terms of the follow-up email, you will receive a full certificate that can be handed in for your CFSP uh, designation if you require educational credits. Uh, so you'll have a certificate that will be in your name and you can submit that in. In addition, there'll be a product knowledge test. All the handouts will be available and then one random person will be reluctantly drawn for some extra Garland swag. Once again, we want to thank you and we look forward to seeing you guys back on November 15th to, to, to review Mary Chef Connex with Greg Hada. Thanks, take care, have a great day.